We're good. Okay. Hi, and welcome. I'm Aaron Tabakman of the Guides Association of New York City. And we want to promote our upcoming award show, the Apple Awards. And I'm here with the hosts of the 2019 Apple Awards, the Bowery Boys. Hello. Hey, Greg Young and Tom Myers. Hi. Hi. Um, nice to be here. It's great to be here. Awesome. The Bowery Boys uh, have won uh, awards at the, at the Apple Awards. In 2014, they won the Best Podcast uh, Award, Best uh, in Radio Programs and Podcasts. And in 2018... They won Best Nonfiction for their book, Adventures in Old New York. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, and we're eagerly anticipating March 4th, and you're, <laughs> you're hosting the award show. Yeah, we are, we are too. We're, we're sort of like, you know, we're, we're figuring out what we're planning on performing or how we're planning on shaping our material for the show. It should be exciting. I thought you were going to say we're, we're trying to figure out what we're going to wear. Well, that too, actually. We have a few ideas. But. I mean, sometimes you think, oh, should we dress as the Bowery Boys? Should we go 19th century? You know, but um, it can be hard to find those outfits. Although you are yes. in a great period. <laughs> You're in a I'm, for the Bowery Boys, I mean, this is a special occasion. I'm wearing my 1920s a gangster pinstripe suit. I fig figured it was appropriate to... Uh, yeah, no, it makes a lot more sense than wearing this, which I got at the Banana Republic. <laughs> but but uh, um, yeah, it would be nice to wear a top hat, actually. Yeah. Maybe even some soap locks. We could dress like the actual Bowery Boys from the 19th century. Do you have a top hat? There's probably... By the way, can we talk about where we are right now? We're in the yeah. amazing Museum right. of Interesting Things. We are doing this uh, recording at the Museum of Interesting Things, a great institution of very unique things curated by Denny Daniel. And a museum yeah. that lives up to its name. Yes, <laughs> and lives in the village. Mm -hmm. um, and we literally had to stop pointing at things and asking about, you know, little details in the corner because otherwise we'd never start taping this. Yes. It's incredible. So, yes, the Museum of Interesting Things. Yes. Uh, so I think we can find a top hat or two around here. <laughs> there probably is one. There's one. <laughs> there we go. Three. I can identify. It's like those, like, it's like those games where you're trying to search for objects. So it's I'll like, there's one. one. There's one. Yes. Okay. Just to, you know, kind of I don't, I don't, yeah, okay, there. sure. Sure. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right. So, the Bowery Boys in Bowery Boys type hats. I love it. My head's a little bit. So, guys, let's, let's, get, let's get to know you guys a little bit and, yeah. what, and your love for New York City history. Why New York City history? Why do you spend all, so many hours of your life talking about and, and reading and promoting New York City history? Hmm. Well, I mean, we started the podcast. I mean, there was a, there was a, a, a fairly personal reason for doing it. We were both living in the Lower East Side. We started the show um, at Tom's old apartment on Essex, and I lived down on East Broadway. Uh, and it's like I just wanted to know more about the neighborhood that we were in. And uh, it's because it's so historic down in the Lower East Side. You can't really escape history. Even even with all the changes right now, even with like all sorts of different things moving in and craft beer and fancy cheese places, you're still surrounded by history. So part of it was informed by us living in the Lower East Side, I think. And, and choosing a subject that we also wanted to learn with. We didn't pretend to be experts in New York City history or even really terribly well versed in it when we started the show i mean we were literally learning on the job mm -hmm. um we've done 282 shows now so i think mm. we've learned quite a bit more along the way <laughs> and written the book about it you know so so we've certainly um learned quite a bit in the 12 years that we've been doing the show but i would even say even and even at 12 years later i, I still think one of the driving forces of, is like if we want to like learn something there's something that like a, a subject that we both want to know more about we choose it as a subject. So it's like we're, we are uh, satisfying our own curiosity as well as hoping to inspire others. Ah, well, you certainly inspired me when I was working at Grayline. I was going, you know, learning about history, and I listened to your podcast every week. Oh, oh right. awesome. Just cool. to be able to do a great double-decker tour. <laughs> so, um, Thank you. Let's learn a little bit about, well, how, let's little, little bit about you guys, maybe your background, where you're from, how, how you got to New York, <laughs> You're not from New York. Mm -hmm. Starting uh, with you, Greg. Where are you from, and how did how did you arrive to New York? Well, yeah, I'll start with me because this is where the story intersects with Tom at a certain point in my bio. So I was born in Southwest Missouri in the town called Springfield, Missouri, in the heart of the Ozarks, and I actually lived there, you know, all the way through high school, and um, then went to the University of Missouri for journalism. Mm. Uh, got my journalism degree it's there. Good school there. 
Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it still is one of the best schools. I was sure. very lucky to be in a state, having an interest in journalism and then being in a state with the biggest school. Um, in 1992, it was the first time that I came to New York. Um, as an, I lived here for the summer as an intern for Entertainment Weekly magazine. And the first place I lived was in an NYU dorm in the East Village. So pretty much like came here, scared little child, three months later, moved back to Missouri and was like, oh, I'm living in New York. I'm coming back there as soon as I get my degree. Um, my roommate, one of my roommates when I was in college, um, was a woman named Elizabeth. She was one of my best friends. She also happens to be the older sister of Tom. Oh, so, okay. um, so I grew up in northern Ohio in a small town called Bellevue, uh -huh. on very near Lake Erie. Um, and so my sister, in the late, well, no, it would be the early 90s, right, when you started school? Yeah. 90, uh, 91. Mm -hmm. Went out of state to the University of Missouri because of their great journalism school, and I think by the end of her freshman year was living with you. I think she yeah, met you right so, away. Yeah, we we worked at the student newspaper together, and yeah. I mean she's now a journalism professor. So I mean that's the she, direction a she went. Excuse yeah. me, a professor of podcasting. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. At professor Ohio, of podcasting at Ohio uh, University, which is another fine another good school. journalism uh -huh. school. Yeah. Um. So Elizabeth Hendrickson. So, uh, so she's. Fabulous, um, and it's still very, very close to both of us. Um, but uh, I moved to New York in 93 uh, to go to Columbia, and I was here. Uh, I graduated in 97. Uh, but during that period, I spent a year and a half in Paris. And when I was in Paris, I started studying the history of Paris and the history of cities, mm. and got really sort of interested in how cities worked and were developed over the years. Um, and so I think I came back to New York, um, finished and, and graduated with a new appreciation for New York, the city that I was mm -hmm. lucky enough to be living in. So I, I dug more into uh, the history of New York. So that then a couple years later, we're both living in the Lower East Side and Greg comes over with his new MacBook um, that has a program on it called GarageBand. And mm -hmm. GarageBand, you could click a button and record a podcast. We didn't know what a podcast was. It was 2006. I mean, right? yeah, 2000, 2007. 2007. We had talked about doing one in 2006. We had talked about doing an online radio show, um, but mm -hmm. didn't know how that would work. So in 2007, he comes over with this, and we recorded the very first episode in June of 2007. I and mean, you know, it's funny because I don't think a podcast like didn't even exist until like I think 2003 or 2005, depending right. on where you want to see the origin date. So I mean, I'm just always like plunging back into my memories thinking like how did we even know what a podcast was i mean it must have just been something we had just learned about in 2007 yeah, well because we were looking at internet radio shows yeah but it was confusing because you would have to stream them people had like toolbars on their browsers where they could stream online radio stations and things and people would just happen to, you'd have to listen at the right time in order to hear it mm -hmm. and so when we heard about podcasts the fact that you could download the show and then you could listen to it whenever you wanted to on your iPod, which people had in 2007, you know, it seemed like uh, a nice solution for us, and it was just something that was fun. We, we did it as kind of a gag. Just mm. We didn't think that, you know, uh, t 12 years later, we'd be sitting yeah. on a sofa in the Museum of Interesting Things <laughs> talking about how we're about to host, you know, the Gannick Awards. Gannick Awards. You guys um, are podcast then, stars. And that this would be our job. Then, so... So how, what did you listen to other podcasts to prepare you for the Bowery Boys podcast? Did you listen to like maybe mm -hmm. Keith and the Girl or? or well, the, it's funny because like it's not really kind of. Um, I wouldn't say. I mean, I know I was listening at the time to things like Slate Political Gap Fest. I know was happening. We talked about that and every week. There was a show, there was a show called It's All Politics on NPR mm -hmm. that is actually we almost have ripped off our shtick from yeah. from these from. Um, it was Ron Ken. and Ken. And that's, but that show is no longer around. But they then, did a lot of puns and talked politics every week, and we we adored those two. I mean, Ron Elvin yeah. is still on NPR. He's on their It's All Politics show, um, yeah. or NPR, the NPR Politics. Yeah, I think whatever. it's yeah. But that's anyway. But then there's also, and I didn't, didn't even, I hadn't even listened to it back then. But you had. There's also people compare us a lot to Car Talk. Oh, yeah. oh, click and clack. Yeah, 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 which is which is you know a show for those who don't know it, a show about two men who have people calling in to talk about cars. And the thing is with that show 
is at a certain point you actually kind of stop listening to it about cars because it's just you listen for the chemistry. Their personalities take and over. How they, yeah, and how they the talk, yeah, and how they talk about these things. So it's so fascinating. I haven't owned a car in decades, but like I still love listening to it. So you know, it's a little bit of that too. I mm-hmm. think some of those those are probably some of our early inspirations. I think. Yeah. So how has the podcast changed from the early days in two thousand seven to today, two thousand nineteen? I mean, there's so many topics you've addressed and so many uh, you know shows you've done. I mean, yeah. certainly you've evolved I think as that, podcasters. Yeah, I think that one of the very fortunate things about choosing New York City as a subject is that it's an inexhaustible subject. Yeah, and even absolutely. by the time you come back to a story years later, it's changed enough that you can tell it again, you know, in many mm-hmm. cases. Or you realize that you missed a big part of the story. So we were kind of... Um, you know, I, we, we tackled some big subjects early on that we're now coming back to and revisiting mm-hmm. uh, because we know that we can do them better now than we did 10 years mm. ago. Uh, but otherwise, no, I think that we're, we're trying to take on perhaps more interesting topics or things that seem, you know, like harder nuts to crack. Uh, well, we have a good bed of knowledge from our, like, first two or three years. We like when, to think. When we were, like, doing a ton of shows, our frequency was, like, weekly for a long time um and we that, have full-time jobs <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah i mean we almost burnt out uh that's definitely for sure but the that almost gave us like sort of a bedrock of information so that um we could start thinking about topics more deeply it's this, this idea of like you look under one subject and there's five more there yeah you know it's right. people are always asking like don't you get are you running out of subjects it's like the opposite mm. we have our list of subjects is longer than ever Right. You know, and it's... Become, and, but yeah. they're, they're becoming more, I think, more interesting, too, because we were doing, you know, early on, it would be like, the Chrysler building. And now it's more like, I mean, I'm, we're, we're researching one for Scott Joplin's decade in New York. You know, that's right. much it's more, a more specific. more specific and, yeah. right, and less general. Yeah. Yeah. Although we still have to tackle subjects like the Empire State Building because... People like... Yeah, people, people still like, like those, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's finding a balance. So what would you say is your most memorable episode... In the 12 years you've been doing the show? Ooh, memorable. Hmm. Um, I mean, there's there's many memories. Um, I would, <laughs> how about this? I think um, the most popular show that we've ever done, which is absolutely no surprise, um, is our Subway shows. We did two shows just on, again, this is an example. We did two shows on the history of the Subway. It was part of a five-series s- show on just New York City transportation. Um, at the time, that made sense. I feel like today, Tom, we could we couldn't do we, it. We could expand that into like fifteen shows. Well, like, yeah, <laughs> one of the problems is we can't stop talking now. You know? <laughs> so early on, with less knowledge, you could just kind of like crank out a two-parter on the history of the subway. Yeah. I don't think we could do a two-parter on the history of the subway because a we'd feel like frauds. Right. There'd be things, very yes. important things that would be getting lo- left out of the story, um, and we're not yet good enough to figure out how to compress it into two shows. Mm-hmm. So it's like, uh, so that's achievable perhaps someday. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that we we talk. We, first of all, we record a typical show now for two hours, and then we cut it down to one hour. Oh, okay. We'd like it to be shorter, mm-hmm. even, yeah, because <laughs> one hour is still kind of too long. Yeah, I notice podcasts are getting shorter and shorter now. I listen to other podcasts. Well, they're... it's funny, because there's, there's many podcasts that are going smaller, and there's actually a few that are going larger. Yeah. The Per episode? Per episode, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, it just depends on what the kind of the show is, and I think that it really is your, what people are responding to. Is as they get listeners, as they get more and more uh, interactions with people, they're finding out how those people are listening to those shows. So, for instance, a lot of people listen to our show when they're on commutes, mm-hmm. when they're in the subway, in the subway, when they are exercising, so doing all, laundry, washing dishes. <laughs> so many of those things tend to be about fifty minutes long. Right. Uh-huh. So people usually like, but then yeah. there are uh, there are other types of podcasts that people listen to in different ways. Like, uh, there's a lot of podcasts that people listen to in cars, which people, there's some that listen right. to us in cars, but not obviously as many. And then in that case, those shows can perhaps be longer. So, Or if I, they drive, right, they're, they're taking a long trip, they're going back to see their folks in Indiana or whatever, and then they, 
they load up yeah. on a bunch of them and then they binge all the way across. So you have audience metrics then. You know who your yeah. audience is and the demographics. And they're, and I mean, it's anonymous when... data here. We're not Facebook. <laughs> well, we have, dry, yeah, we, have dry, we have dry information, meaning it's sort of like the stats, whatever. And then we have the, like, the sort of one-on-one -on -one interactions with people and asking them. And yeah. Like, you know, and asking and them we specifically. Have and people write us letters and things. I mean, like someone wrote us a letter and said they were listening to us while she was going into labor, for instance. I mean, I don't think that is a common way of listening, but... It was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've had, you know, other... We've had extremely unusual circumstances that people have connected with our show in amazing ways. But, uh, yeah, so there's, there are, like... We get a, we do have a sense, I think. And back to that 45-minute point, or that... I think the sweet spot is somewhere between 35 and 45 minutes. I would agree, yeah. Um, because that's also the average... Um, commute in the subway, and ah. we know that people look through, they don't necessarily look at the most recent show, they mm -hmm. look to see what seems appealing to them that morning, and how long it is. What can they listen to, either going there, or going and coming back, you know, so... Well, that's one nice thing about the podcast going. format, is that yeah. you don't have to listen to the, that week's episode. If you want to go back no. to 2008 and listen to one of your ghost podcasts, yeah. you could do that, and yes. you know, I've, I've done that myself, or you want to listen to your New York City Marathon podcast, you can maybe do that. They're all, yeah, I mean, so, they're all available, so... Um, free, we should. <laughs> how did the uh, live shows come about? Whose idea was it, and how did they take off? Well, the interesting thing is the... It's a little bit of a necessity. One of them is a, it's a desire and a necessity. A desire because it helps us grow the show, it makes it deeper connections with the audience. It's a necessity in the sense that now, um, this is the hot new thing in stage entertainment is podcasters on stage. I mean, you have podcasters... It's a hot new thing, watching guys talking to mics and not move. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's thrilling. The, uh, the, um, the women from My Favorite Murder, it's just these two, the two people on stage talking about, like, you know, like, details of, like, a historical murder. Just two people on stage, they're selling out King's Theater. I mean, mm. like, so it's a, it's a new way of people <laughs> interacting with their podcasts. So... It's just been a little tricky for us. It, we, we sort of entered this market a little late because our shows are different. We're not sitting here, you know, talking about, like, politics or the latest, like, film. We're actually, like, doing a bunch of facts. So our actual process is sort of, an, a, a, would be an terribly boring live experience because mm -hmm. it would involve two hours of us stopping and starting and like looking at our notes and like researching and doing that book and getting that book or whatever. So, um, you do story, while. you do storytell though. Oh, I mean, sure. I'm yeah, very yeah, captivated yeah. by your storytelling. Well, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we have, so we've been doing some live shows as part of various podcast festivals. Um, we've done the Brooklyn podcast festival twice now. Um, with great crowds at the Bell House in Brooklyn and had a wonderful time and it's mm -hmm. actually really fun for us to get that energy yeah. back. We kind of can't believe it because we spend so much time in a room <laughs> behind two mics with nobody else around except maybe my cat, you know, <laughs> and we're recording and then you put it out there and you see these metrics of thousands of people listening but it's kind of abstract because you sure. can't see them. Right. But when you suddenly put it out there that you're going to be in a live space and, you know, people buy the tickets and they show up, it's really an amazing experience yeah. for us to come out and actually see people and meet people and talk to them mm -hmm. uh, because it, it reminds you that there are real people listening to this. Sure, so, yeah, it puts a face yeah, to the and, numbers. And then yeah. back, back, to your, I, back to your comment on storytelling, I mean, our, one of our most successful live performances has been our Joe's Pub Ghost Story Show. Mm -hmm. Again... That is already so different from our regular podcast. It was actually easier to adapt for the stage because it is pure storytelling and it is more like a, 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 a sit around the campfire type of thing. So that we could do in a very different way. But, you know, that's not like our regular show. That's a little different. Why do you think the ghost podcasts are so popular or like amongst the most popular podcasts? That you it's so produce? funny because they are. They are, right. they are definitely among our most popular famous, although there is a small vocal minority of people who hate them. And there's okay. like, you don't, which is funny because a lot I of mean people... mean the people who like history. <laughs> the people who want the purest history, right. and they don't want any folklore. Okay. Because, you know, folklore is where it bleeds into, like, you know, like, 
hearsay. Sure. So, and that's what ghost stories are kind of what they are. And we do. Plus, our... we've been telling these stories for twelve years, so we're kind of scraping the bottom <laughs> of the barrel at this point. Like, come on, give me some, you know, ghost story. Is this, about... is, this is it haunted? Is this place haunted? It'll, it'll, that'll do. That'll do. <laughs> Have you ever been afraid in that spot? Yeah. So, um, but I think that because they are, I mean, those shows are just like just pure entertainment. Um, but because we add history to them, I think that that's... I mean, most people don't tell ghost stories that way, actually. Yeah. You know, like, movies don't, like, stop and give you, like, a 15-minute history on the house that you're about to see filled with ghosts, you know? And that's kind of what we do. There's probably mm. a good reason they don't do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. It would be harder to adapt us to the screen, maybe. Who knows? But, like, I mean, we could try it. Now, we at Gannick love you. Our members love you. I mean, you've won two Apple Awards yeah, we already. Yeah, honored. Thank for you. Best Podcast and for Best Nonfiction Book. I mean, the nonfiction book, I think, is an incredible achievement. There's so many great nonfiction books out there about New York. And um, you two won, won it for Adventures in Old New York. Yes. Please tell me a little bit about how the book came about and, uh, and you know, the process of, make, of writing it. Sure. Well, um, it was hard. <laughs> and, I mean, the book came out two years ago, so this is 2019. It came out in the summer 2017. Um, and we got the book deal, I guess, two years before. Had about a year to write the book and about a year to edit the book. Um, in short, it's a history of New York, old New York being Manhattan from tip to top. So it's a history of neighborhood by neighborhood from the Battery all the way to the top of Manhattan. Yeah. Uh Greg wrote the first He's, he sometimes undersells himself here. He wrote the first draft, and then I came in and like ah, added, added color it, yeah. to it and some jokes. You know, the it's a really all it was was an excuse for us to talk about our favorite places in Manhattan. I mean, that's like we had to confine it because like it's it was it's already a monster book. Right. And so although it's we five hundred thirty pages, wow. was, but although it is like old New York and a bulk of it is really like stuff and things you can see and find before the nineteenth century. I mean, we have stuff like references to the 1970s and things. It was, it's really, at the end of the day, we wanted to like put our personality into a book form. And so that was like the kind of strategy that we went into for that. And so the thing is, I think that people really love it. There's a ton of information that I, if it was like a, a little bit more handheld, you could literally just walk around with as a, as a tour guide. I mean, people as it is still... Still do, and they should, but... You could also walk around with it as a weapon. <laughs> you, know, I, you could really knock somebody out. But well, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's sort of like the show. I mean, we could strive to actually come out with a second um, edition of that that is perhaps half the size. That would be, that would be something. A little handheld mm, version. Yeah, if there are any... I don't know, book publishers out there. <laughs> and you also started uh, recently Bowery Boys Watts. Yes. Mm -hmm. And our own Emma Guest Consalis. Actually, yeah, she is one, one of your tour guides. guides. Actually, the inaugural tour. We have, right, and Carl Raymond and Jeff Dobbins, all Gannick members. Um, and we're thrilled to have Emma and Carl and Jeff. Um, we're, we're developing these walks with the guides around popular shows or topics on the Bowery Boys. So... We're trying to take, we've had so many requests from people about how can, you know, can we lead them around and do things. And we also recognize the importance of official, like, professional licensed tour guides. Mm, yeah, yeah. We are not those people. We are, so. we are definitely, here's the thing is that, you know, people would love to go on a, a tour with us. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we're not tour guides. Tour guides don't just have to know the history. There are like they have to be psychiatrists. They have to do group <laughs> control. There's like all of the first aid factors. They right. have to like logistics. They, they have to be mm -hmm. kind of performers in a, in a way that actually I don't think that I am personally. Yeah. So that's we why get to we, story tell into microphones and make it interesting. But like we don't have to know what the the listener is going through at that moment or how receptive they are. If they've had a bad day, if they just stubbed their toe, you know the whole thing. So. Yes. We have mad props to tour guides and are really happy to be working with some now um, and, and developing this business really together. Yeah, well, no, very, very exciting. Um, I know there are just two of you, but do you ever think there might be a third Bowery boy or a fourth? Well, you know what's funny? He, he or she could be in here for all <laughs> Well, I mean, we do actually, I mean, this, 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 that, that is a good question. And early on, um, we have uh, this friend uh, of ours named Tanya, who has actually been on three shows 
when Tom was away. And if she was still living here, we would incorporate her. Oh, wow. Uh, not only because she's just a fascinating storyteller, but she's got the greatest voice. She's got such a good voice. I, I like I almost like going back and listening to her shows. Um, but, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's... We have thought about how to, like, do something like that when... You know, we can't always do every single show together. Um, and also, we understand that we are sort of two similar kind of profiles. You know what I'm saying? And that maybe it would be nice saying? to have... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, we want to bring in other voices to the show. Yeah. yeah. Um, we do have, you have guests. So, right. So, we go out and we talk to other people and we try to bring them on the show. So, we're, we are um, trying to do more of that and figuring out kind of what the right balance is to sort of bring other voices in, to tape on location, to go outside of New York even, to try to make the show compelling, but also uh -huh. not stray too far from its New York roots. Have you ever done a show and then realized by the end of it that you made a mistake and oh. had to go back? I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, mostly, <laughs> most of the time in those situations, we catch them like five minutes before we're about to hit... Uh, upload. upload, right? Yes. Um, no, no, no. Upload. Up, upload, upload. Yeah, no. We're actually when so we record the show as I said for two hours, and then it has to cut down to about fifty-five minutes mm -hmm. or less, ideally. It never is. Um, and one of us edits the show, mm -hmm. so we take turns um, editing the show, and that's a day or two process. Sometimes we have an assistant who helps us out with that, but one of us is doing the final edit. Part of that job is to do the fact checking, too. And to just verify. Uh, sure. And so there, often it's not like a huge error. It can even be something that's clumsily stated, you know, because it's we don't have like that. Yeah. We don't have a script per se. We have notes uh -huh. in front of us with details, but we don't have a script. Uh -huh. So sometimes, because we're acting on and doing this on the fly, it's like it just comes out in an awkward way that sounds confusing and is not clear and needs to be stripped away. I mean, and yeah, most of it is like brain freezes, not sort of factual errors that happen. I do this thing all the time, which is pulling Tom's hair out and pulls mine when I, which is like, I'm always saying, if I, mi if I mean 1850, I will just, if I'm rattling off, I'll be like, and then in 1950, this happened. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I just, I move everything a century. It's just like a, it's a, it's not a, like on the paper, it says 1850. It comes out of my mouth, 1950. So that kind of thing happens. And so you have to kind of do re-records or just trim or, you know. Or you just have to stop. I mean, it's even like with recording. Well, we're not stopping here, but we re-record things constantly. So in that two hours, we will say something, realize it doesn't really sound great. And so we'll just restate the entire thing. Yeah. Or if it's... Mm -hmm. If we make a joke and the other one didn't respond uh, very, you know, adequately to the joke, then we might have that person yes. laugh again, you know? Uh, so we, we, we're able to do a lot in the editing. But if we do have, if we do find that there's some sort of major error once the show is released, I mean, we, we have, we can put things in notes and things, but if it's, if it's severe enough, we actually do have the ability to go in and start stripping things and re re uploading them, and it's not it's the people who listen first hear, heard the wrong version, but then going forward, it's a corrected version. And we record in a studio, usually on Twenty Sixth Street, but we at both of our places we have our own studios as well. Oh, so, so you we, can do some touch ups. You can uh, do some. Oh yeah, yeah. Bump bumps. You and, can and drop in drop things in. to f to fix it. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, where did the the opening come from? I, and that sort of got me sort of intrigued by the podcast. The hey, 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 well, it's the Bowery Boys. Hey, <laughs> it, was, it was like an unthought out, like on the fly type of thing that has um, stuck with us because people won't let us change it. Actually, very soon. So we recorded that just in the first take. We were saying like, Greg said, "I'll say hey, it's the Bowery Boys," and then you say hey, and we're like. Let's just try it. So that was the first time we wow. ever tried it. And we played it back and it just made us laugh. So we ran with it for the very first show. Um, and then we just, I guess we're too lazy to re-record it. And we kept it for like a year. And then we said to our listeners after one year, you know, like all 15 of them, what do you think? Should we re-record this? And people said, no, 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 keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it. And so, so to this day, the problem is the underlying music, the theme song, yeah. is... It's a garage band, like, 
royalty free loop. It's not even like a real song. So, and it's also it's like it was recorded in like a much poorer quality. So, we would love to just like maybe. I don't think we can ever get away or put a new theme song. I think people would rebe re rebel. But um, we might re-record it with an actual band. Or if there are any musicians out there that are willing yeah. to lend their talents to Greg and Tom and to get a theme yeah. song. So that is like, we may... That's a dream. We may do that if we can. It, 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 we'll see how it... We'll see what the reaction is. Yeah. It kind of... It, we've r sort of copied and pasted that file so mm -hmm. many times. I think it's degraded to the point where it sounds kind of like a scratchy old record yeah, that could be in the Museum of Interesting Things, actually. If it were a, if, if it were a, if it were a cassette, it would have broken by now. Oh, yeah. car stereo. Yeah. So. And that's your your sister we heard for many years uh, at the beginning. Yeah. Saying, the Broadway that's, Brothers that's, is brought to you yeah. by... It all goes back to my sister Elizabeth. Yeah, she was in town to, um, to work uh, for an, a journalism event, and she was staying in my apartment in the Lower East Side, and I said to her, okay, we need a new opening message... Um, sponsored by Euro Cheapo, which was uh, yeah. which is my travel site that I started in 2001, and so let's do it in mock NPR sponsorship style. <laughs> so we had her; we were coaching her mm -hmm. to say it in that kind of like NPR sponsor voice. Um, and we probably had her do it like 20 times. She was so over it by the time we were done. But it yeah, worked. So that's her. Vo yeah, so that's her voice. That's yeah. the sister. That's the one. Who's or just, just, a, this. just a few more lightning round questions for oh. you so we can really get to know who you are. Yes, um, we'll keep it brief. <laughs> um, what are some of your favorite neighborhoods in New York City? <laughs> keep it brief. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brief every up. time, okay, this question gets asked before, and I always say, I'll tell you honestly, my favorite neighborhood in New York City is Red Hook. And I'm not just saying that because I live right next door to it. But it is a neighborhood that, to me, always... It is a neighborhood of, like, 20 different personalities. And, you know, it is by no means the most beautiful neighborhood, although certain parts of it are, are very lovely. Um, it's a very misunderstood neighborhood. It's a very abused neighborhood. Mm. But it has... It, has the, it shows the wear and tear of New York City history, yeah. like, out in front. Um, I love it. I walk over there all the time. I always see something very new. And you can walk from the weird Tesla car dealership to the pier, down to the Ikea, over to DeFonte's um, sandwich shop, and even over to Columbia. I mean, it just, like, to me, it tells a different story every time we're there. It's a great neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Tom? I would say very briefly, I mean, I think that it's usually whatever neighborhood we've just recorded about, you know, because we dive into it, and it's just like you become That's true. fascinated and yeah. super enthusiastic about whichever neighborhood. So in a way, it's kind of, we just did a show on downtown Brooklyn. So it's because of all that research, it's like it opens your eyes to this new place and, and it, or to seeing the neighborhood differently and understanding it differently. So, but... I would also say, say say the Lower East Side because that's where we lived yes. uh, forever and that's where we started and I still love it so much. And I would also say around Penn Station. I know, mm, <laughs> but like choice. that area, that area sort of like North Chelsea. A friend of mine called it Nopo or Sopo south of the Post no, Office. That's <laughs> never, never uh, calling it that. But but actually, I'm talking like gritty old sort of like not newfangled Madison Square. I'm talking like old like garment district. Andrew's Coffee Shop, old school gritty New York button shop places. Mm. Like that's disappearing, A. Yeah. And B, it's like it reminds me, it takes me back to when I first came here, you know, and was sure. really first living here in the early nineties and like it's still there's still some of that flavor there. And Interesting. That, and I I love it. Interesting. I love it like, you know, what some coffee from a guy in the car, you know? Like yeah, sweet, yeah. Like just, the, the blue cup. Yeah. The blue Greek cup. <laughs> um very briefly, favorite buildings. Do you have a favorite building? I mean, like, I, to live in, to work in, to walk by, there's so many. Uh, uh, I'm just going to, like, cop out and say all of the buildings on Governor's Island. Oh, okay. uh, because I remember when Gov they uh, kind of reopened Governor's Island for people to come out there. Was it, like, 2007, 2006? And, like, you could wander around all those old houses. It was pretty much like, you can just do whatever you want. Uh, those probably set my impressions or set my course for doing this show almost more than anything because it was just such a diverse, it was like, 
old Civil War forts and like you know uh, um, old turn of the century homes and then like a 20th century church that was out there and um, so that all of that to me it just says so much about New York in a, in a strange way because it is so kind of isolated and was a you know it was a military outpost for so yeah. long but I would say that's probably my Tom? my top five. this is so generic but it's so true for me I think my favorite building in New York is the New York Public Library oh, okay um, just because I spend I mean it's sort of like a second office for right me, and the archives there the amazing spaces I when we were uh, studying for this Walt Whitman show that we did a few weeks ago uh-huh. I got to go th- first up into one of the research libraries an amazing view uh, an amazing room uh, that you can gain access to when you're doing that kind of research, and then go through five early editions of Leaves of Grass in this amazing space with people who were bringing these like treasures out to me, mm-hmm. and I got to go through them and touch history in this historic space, mm. and that's when you realize like, oh my God, like there are this city is filled with treasures that are accessible <laughs> to you, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. and the, and you walk by these structures every day and you don't even know what's on the other side of the wall. Yeah. We're not too far from FAPS, actually. We're no, oh, we hung, nice. out, hung out. Oh, yes. We hope that there's some kind of, um, what, um, we're working for some kind of landmarking status, or at least or some plaque. kind of a plaque. Yeah, oh, okay. Plaque. Can't really, yeah. I don't, who, who knows what exists down in the basement? There and might be something. But we anyway. should mention FAPS, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like an early bohemian bar that was located on Broadway between Bleecker and what, West 3rd. Yeah. Uh, or East 3rd. Really, like one of the first bohemian on spots Broadway. that could be called bohemian in New York City. In sure. the basement. Yeah, so. the birth of bohemia. Okay. You have dinner with five guests. They can be anybody, oh, New York guests, though. Five living, uh, dead, uh, five guests, who would they be? So we have to have Robert Moses there, right? Okay. He's going to be there. And then we might as well have Jane Jacobs there, too, so that we can keep things interesting. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I'd like, be some fighting at the dinner table. I was have he to would say have to at least... They, like, would, they would dominate the conversation. Perhaps that's why you need to have um, Madam C.J. Walker. Or actually, take that back. I'm rescinding that invitation and inviting her daughter. Oh, Amelia. 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 Yes. Who was basically kind of like the patron of the Harlem Renaissance and just a super fascinating character who sort of gets forgotten a little bit. She would be like the one who would be able to like hold the dinner party together. So she'll be there. <laughs> oh. if, Ro- if it is Jane and Robert. Uh, we need to, fine. I want to invite Dwight Clinton too. Because Dewitt I mean, Clinton. Dwight Clinton really, like, with his Erie Canal, 1825. That is what fueled the growth of New York as, like, this boom town, right? Okay, right? It's what made New York the hub for shipping from the mid, the, the expanding Midwest, you know, through the Great Lakes sure. and down the Hudson. From New York's ports out to Europe, like, that's what made the city's economy. So we owe a great debt to him. Sure. And so we, the final guest would have to be someone who could take from all these stories, and I think the final guest would have to be Nellie Bly. Ah. We, have to have a writer, we have to have a writer at the table. Would a she be dressed as Nellie Bly? Maybe she could be like in sort of like Oh, she'd be one of her costumes. Yes. Oh, she could be disguised as someone else yes. for a story that she would be doing, because that's famously what she would often do. So, yeah. So, can you see if you can set that up for us? <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. So, we got Robert Moses, Jane Jacobs, uh, 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 Lelia Walker, Lily Walker, DeWitt, DeWitt Clinton, Clinton, and, and Nellie Bly. Bly. I'm going to give you so. five more. Oh. Because you're two people. Five oh, more. Oh, sure. Okay. This would be a big, this would be like a five course more. meal. All right, well then, we are going... Where are we? Are we at Sherry's? Oh, oh, oh sure. Oh, oh yeah. The actual place. Yeah. We'll do Sherry's. All right, so then, in that case, we're going to start, I think... Oh, Emma with... Goldman. All right, she's really hardcore. <laughs> we have... <laughs> well, we need to, like, shake things up a little. I mean, come on. All right, so... I feel uh, like we're going to get some, like, industrialists or something. I was like actually going to uh, throw in Deborah Harry. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. So, yeah. Emma Goldman, Deborah Harry. That's, um, that's a power duo. Yeah. Uh, so, there's a... Um, who, okay, who else? Um, how about... Um, uh, Alexander Hamilton. Good him choice. At the table. Uh, it's a very, you know, obvious choice, but he is a he's a good conversationalist. Cooper? Uh, I mean, we need somebody who's, like, a good... Um, who represents the Gilded Age, but not annoying. <laughs> you know? Uh, and not just like Mark some, Twain? some rich dude. Yes! Well, let's Mark get Twain Twain. Good. All right, so this is this is quite a table going on. <laughs> get one more. Uh, a lot of talkers, a lot of talkers. Um, let's see, I'm from fairly different eras. I think the fifth person... Can you I go would... back for that? P. 
Peter Stuyvesant. Oh, <laughs> ding, ding. I think, I don't, I'm not sure I would want to attend that dinner party, but we could, in fact, just have it and, like, watch it from the other room. Yeah, the, we, only, the other one I might want to attend, but... but and, and Boss Tweed. I think we could probably, let's get Boss Tweed in and send home, do we keep Peter Cooper? Wait, Peter Cooper? Yeah. No, send home Robert Moses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's we home, yeah. Then, then we'll all be stuck in traffic. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Um, I don't know. All right. Yeah. Well, well, it sounds like a it sounds like a great <laughs> evening. Yeah, and what also is going to be a great evening is the Apple Awards oh, that yes, you guys are hosting. Yes. yes. Monday, March fourth, six p.m. Hosted by the the Bowery Boys. Be there. We need you there. It's going to be one of the yes. best Apple Award ceremonies. Very important for preservation. For arts and culture, uh, Greg Young, Tom Myers. And there's a lot. The nominees list. Check out the nominees list. It's, it's fabulous. Has this uh, an interesting thing to spell on me. But the, um, but the, and the nominees list is extraordinary, and yeah. hopefully a lot of those the people will attend. And um, it's a great it's a great list. The people who are being honored are extraordinary. How can people get tickets? Oh, they can get tickets by going to our website. Uh, Gannick.org, and there's a link to get your uh, ticket there, or by going to the box office at the SVA Theater on what's yes. 23rd Street. And uh, seriously, you're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be a great show hosted by these two lovely guys, the Bowery Boys. Cheers. Thank you very much. For Thank welcome. You. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thanks, Denny, for inviting us to the Museum of Interesting Things. Yes. Um, I just feel like I feel like one of the lesser interesting things in here as, a, as a myself, but it's... We're, Grateful to be here. And if we don't make it to the actual award ceremony, it's because we're still here looking at all the <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we'll get Danny to get, uh, make sure you get out of here on time. But uh, Monday, March 4th, guys, SVA Theater. We'll see you then. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.